Neuroscience is not only one of the most fascinating subjects that we can learn about, but it also governs every aspect of our lives. That's why I truly believe that learning about the brain is the best way to understand yourself, the world around you, and to take full control of your life. So with that in mind, let's dive right into nine neuroscience books that I really believe can change your life. First one is Live Wired by David Eagleman, one of my favorite neuroscience authors. This book is all about neuroplasticity, how the brain is constantly rewiring itself in response to our our environment and experiences. One of the most insane chapters is surrounding this idea of sensory substitution. Give our guys eyes in the dark. Many of you might have seen this clip from the popular show Westworld without knowing that it's not actually science fiction and these devices exist in the real world. Sensory substitution transforms the seemingly impossible into the possible. It works through teaching your brain to interpret tactile signals from pins, each pin representing a part of the visual world. This incredible feat showcases the brain's power to rewire itself, turning tactile sensations into visual maps. This method also has real world application and has allowed blind people to recognize their children for the first time. It works by taking data from cameras that are oriented in their visual field and converting the signals to the same grid of pins. A lower resolution signal, sure, but still a truly incredible way for people to experience their loved ones, possibly for the first time. This one, like no other, got me interested in neuroscience as a subject, simply by shining a spotlight on how truly breathtaking the potential of the brain truly is, and how we really need to take care of it so we can nurture that full potential. The next book is called How Emotions Are Made by the brilliant Lisa Feldman Barrett. And this one really made me question everything that I thought I knew about emotions and made me realize that nobody really knows what the hell they are. My biggest takeaway is that our emotions are not always accurate representations of our internal body state. They are actually predictions that are constructed based on our past experiences, based on our learned concepts, and our internal body state in that current moment. When I'm deep in a run and start feeling an overwhelming urge to stop, that's my interoceptive system making a prediction based on my bodily state in that current moment. It sees a raised heart rate, oxidative stress, and a drop of blood glucose, and it's recalling past experiences of fatigue and discomfort and signaling that it might be time to stop, as it knows that when I do quit, all of those physiological markers will return to baseline. But this is a prediction. It's not objective fact that we are harming ourselves or that we cannot continue. Understanding these concepts has been a game changer. It's helped me push through the pain barrier, but not by dismissing my emotions, but by understanding them for what they are. Not accurate, objective truths, but subjective interpretations shaped by past experiences and learned concepts. And most importantly, they can be recategorized. Fascinatingly, I can actually see this directly in my own running data. The initial portion of the run is always the hardest. Labored breathing, sore legs, I always record my worst times. My mind is telling me to quit as a first learned emotional response based on my interoceptive recordings. But as I keep running, paradoxically, it actually gets easier. Since emotions are goal-directed concepts and the feedback loop is continuously saying, he's not quitting, he's not quitting, the internal goal prediction changes from he needs to stop to he needs to run. For this new updated emotion concept, my brain starts producing endorphins, our natural painkillers, adrenaline, which increases my heart rate and cardiac output, as well as dopamine, as my predicted goal concept is finally aligned with my actual goal. This realization has not only improved my running, but also how I interpret and manage my emotions in my everyday life. To prove this point to the absolute extreme, I recently watched an insane documentary called The Iceman, produced by the YouTube channel Yes Theory about the incredible Danish athlete Anders Hoffman, who became the first ever human to complete a long distance triathlon in Antarctica. This includes a 3.8 kilometer swim in negative degree water with literal killer leopard seals, which are known to attack humans, 180 kilometer bike, and then he runs a marathon. In the bleakest moment of this documentary, 25 hours into painstaking endurance in freezing temperatures when everyone, even his own brother, thought he was going to quit, Anders kept repeating something. Limitations are perceptions. Limitations are perceptions. Limitations are perceptions. 
With this updated emotional goal concept, Anders completed the Iceman in 73 painful hours and proved that limitations are perceptions in a way that neuroscience theory cannot. Your limitations are actually perceptions, they are literally hallucinations by your brain in the moment. This means that we really can accomplish so much more than we think we can. The next one is probably the book I recommend the most to people in my life, simply because everyone can get immense value from it. Hardwiring Happiness is a guide to rewiring the brain for joy and resilience. The book explains how we all have a negativity bias, which means generally we let negative experiences overshadow our positive experiences. There's an important evolutionary reason for this, but we don't live in the same world we evolved for. So to optimize our well-being in 2024, we have to learn the methods to move past it. This book is a guide on how to do just that. It's really the one that drove home for me how important it is to make a conscious effort to encode positive experiences and memories. The main way I do this is through expressing gratitude, by taking moments to myself, soaking in everything that nature has to offer, and writing down things I'm grateful for on a daily basis. Study shows that keeping a gratitude journal for only two weeks produced a 28% decrease in perceived stress, 23% decrease in cortisol, a 7% reduction in pro-inflammatory markers, and remarkably even a 9% decrease in progressive age-related neurodegeneration. This is really a guidebook to reaping those benefits every single day, and I think everyone can get immeasurable benefit from that. The next one is called Altered Traits, and it's all about meditation, written by reputable scientists and meditation experts. Beyond the myriad benefits of meditation that are documented in this book, which include decreases in cortisol, improved sleep, cognitive control, focus, and well-being, the part that really stuck to me was the truly fascinating research into master meditators, often called yogis. These are Tibetan monks that have dedicated their lives to the practice of meditation, and my god are their brains fascinating. To fully appreciate this madness, we need to very quickly understand something about brainwaves. Brainwaves are simply electrical patterns in the brain. We classify these patterns by the regularity in which the neurons fire, and they respond very well to particular behaviors that we know. Delta, deep sleep. Theta, drowsiness, light sleep. Alpha, relaxed, calm. Beta, awake, focused. And gamma. Gamma is peak concentration, high level information processing. Think about gamma brain state as your middle of exam, peak focus, and furiously scribbling everything your brain has to offer. We can only very briefly access this stage of higher cognitive focus, and it's incredibly tiring. We all know the feeling of walking out of an exam, and the brain just feels dead. But when the brainwaves of yogis were recorded, the results showed that they can achieve off-the-charts gamma oscillation activity, completely at will and while at rest. This is a mental nirvana we can only dream about. Effortless attention and focus, extreme clarity, no clutter, perfect control over emotions, euphoria, and perfect unity with their bodies. Incredible, right? And all you have to do is meditate in a cave for like 40 to 50 years. Easy. The next book is a world-renowned classic, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, by the incredible late Oliver Sacks. Following his career as a psychiatrist and his amazing patients who are the main heroes in this story. Like Dr. P, who developed a rare form of face blindness, also known as prosopagnosia, that leaves him unable to distinguish between, as the book title suggests, his own wife and a hat, and Jimmy G, who has Korsakov syndrome, and can't remember anything for more than a few seconds, being stuck in a perpetual loop of existence. Then there's William Thompson. Thompson's memory left him with no sense of self, no stable identity. The psyche compensated by producing what's called confabulations of his identity, often highly contradictory. These are improvised identities where Thompson's mind was essentially trying to fill the gaps in his existence. Each identity can be seen as a creative attempt to make sense of his present circumstances, given the absence of a coherent past. While in the police station, he became the police officer. While in the hospital, he assumed the identities of patient, doctor, and surgeon. I read this book many years ago and it filled me with a burning desire to try and understand the complexity of the mind and inspired me towards the incredibly fulfilling path that I'm on at the moment. So a lot of what I've done and where I am is because of this book. Next we have the Bible of Neuroscience. Robert Sapolsky's Behave, an extraordinary journey into the depths of human behavior. Imagine a book that begins at the level of neurons and genes, then zooms out to the level of neurotransmitters, 
and then hormones, and then organs, and ultimately to society as a whole. He challenges myths, stereotypes, and categorization, bringing much needed nuance to every single page. As evident by the 800 pages that this book has, it is certainly not light reading. But the book's true brilliance lies in its ability to make complex concepts accessible, illustrating how neurobiology intertwines with almost all aspects of society, perfect for those who seek a deeper, more mechanistic understanding of human nature. To compensate for the gargantuan bible that is Behave, the next one is The Pocket Book of Neuroscience, by the same author as How Emotions Are Made, Lisa Feldman Barrett, called Seven Brief Lessons About the Brain. I read it cover to cover in two days and it was phenomenal. Lisa Feldman Barrett is the queen of crushing neuroscience myths. From destroying the triune brain model that I learned in my undergraduate neuroscience degree, which says we have a lizard brain and a mammalian control center. If I was to recommend one book on this whole list, I think it would be this one, simply because of how digestible but jam-packed with fascinating neuroscience it really is. This book will transform your entire knowledge of the brain in the time it takes to drink two coffees. The next one is another by David Eagleman. The Brain, the Story of You attempts to bridge the gap between the brain as just a lump of fat in your skull and the phenomenon of actually being human. How we make decisions, how we experience the world, form relationships and make new memory, and ultimately how it determines who we are and our potential. It's another very accessible neuroscience book because it's packed with human stories rather than research and studies. The core message of this book is that you don't perceive objects the way they are, you perceive objects the way you are, sculpted by your biases and beliefs from your experiences. This book is a tale about how these perceptions warp over your lifetime and it's packed with so many fascinating tidbits. Last but not least is Why We Sleep by resident sleep expert Matthew Walker. I think the world is finally moving past hustle culture and appreciating that a lack of sleep is not a status symbol but simply a recipe for anxiety and mediocrity. As always my approach when trying to take something seriously and to make a change in my life is to learn about it. And Matthew Walker is simply the best researcher and communicator about the neuroscience of sleep and its benefits. From how caffeine, sunlight, jet lag affects your sleep, to a stunning neuroscience deep dive into the beautiful orchestral display of memory consolidation during REM sleep, there simply is no competition when it comes to books about sleep. One fact that really stuck with me is that if you usually get 8 hours of sleep and then on any given night for whatever reason you get 6 hours, you can miss up to 90% of your REM sleep due to the mysterious way our sleep stages cycle at night. There's no point drowning on. I really hope that you enjoyed the video. Thank you so much for staying to the end. Every book that I talked about can be bought down below. I really do believe that a great book read at the right moment can change your life. Consider subscribing for more amazing neuroscience content because the quality is only going to get better and better for here. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.